mass around to explain that growth of structure, and we call that uh, mass dark matter. So that's on gigaparsec scales. If we zoom into a single galaxy, we can, we can do a measurement of how fast a galaxy rotates as a function of, it, of, of distance from the center, and we can compare that with how fast it should rotate if it were only composed of its luminous matter, there's this gap between what we observe and, and, and what we can calculate from the luminous matter, and we attribute that also to dark matter. And notice that this is happening on something that's a million times smaller in linear scale than on, on the large scale structure. And so the, the bottom line is that if we tally up all the matter in the universe, we see that the vast majority, 95% of it, is stuff that, uh, I use the term baryons, that's shorthand for all the stuff we know about, the, the stuff that you and I are made of. Uh, and, and so in some sense, uh, we don't matter, right? Um, most of the universe is this strange stuff, and we really would like to understand it. Um, we can use simulations to put some constraints on it, but basically what we know now is that it gravitates and it doesn't do much else. We want to discover, well, is there anything else it can do? In order to do that, we have to understand the gravity very carefully if we're going to, uh, say, make hypotheses or test hypotheses about whether it's made of some exotic uh, uh, a particle like the axion or uh, the lightest supersymmetric particle. So the beauty about this, the, the studying dark matter is actually wonderful for a computational scientist. And that's because the physics is simple. All you need to know is that F equals G M, o, M over R squared and F equal M A. That gets you a set of ordinary differential equations that you can plug into a large machine, calculate a way to make your predictions. The, ca the, the computation is challenging because naively that should scale as order n squared, where n is the number of particles you're trying to simulate. Ideally, you'd like n to be 10 to the 80 uh, because that's the number of dark matter particles in the universe. Uh, but uh, <coughs> It is a challenge uh, that it requires development of new algorithms, and of course, it's a challenge that lets you win Gordon Bell prizes. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that makes it hard, as I specify here, is this large spatial uh, range that I've already talked about, and that motivates me and others to use these tree structures to uh, uh, make a divide and conquer algorithms to solve it. With the spatial range is a large temporal range, so many time steps, similar to the issues that, uh, um, that we heard about from uh, NAMD. Uh, and then we have this, because gravity is a long range force, we need to communicate information across many processor domains in order to do the calculation. Uh, just a review of how this tree code works. Uh, we, uh, we divide up space into this hierarchy of cells. Uh, the, there are various size structures, so we need more resolution, for example, in the center than we do in the edges. And so in order to calculate the forces of, say, the, the particles in this cell, we don't have to look at all the other cells. We can group everything within that red cell as one interaction and use that interaction represented here instead of everything below it, and thereby reducing what is nominally an n squared algorithm to an order n log n algorithm. So that's uh, one slight overview of how uh, our, our tree code works. Uh, making it work in parallel uh, means dividing the tree into, am I missing? Oh, oh, okay, or the, thanks Sanjay. Dividing the, the, 
uh, tree into what we call tree pieces, where one tree piece sits on a processor, well, virtual processor, or char, in the, in the language of char++. Plus plus. And, and this tree piece contains uh, nodes from, from the lease all the way up to, to, to the root. So every char has a, has a copy of the root. These uh, tree pieces are placed on processors in the usual uh, charm load balancing uh, uh, framework. And each tree piece does both local work and global work. So uh, that is uh, searching the global tree and searching the local tree for forces. Uh, we have an addition here we recognize that if one tree piece needs a remote node, probably the other tree pieces on that same processor need that same remote node. And so we, ca we have a software cache to reduce uh, the amount of communication. And that, uh, 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 and the usual charm plus plus overlap of computation and, and, and communication happens naturally. And that allows us to scale to large numbers of cores. This is on the Blue Waters machine, where we have a 2 billion highly clustered, similar to that opening uh, picture that I showed you, uh, scaling to over 100,000 nodes. So, so this is just wonderful. You, you get this wonderful uh, uh, structure that forms. Uh, so this is a small slice uh, uh, of a small piece of the universe. And, and again, we're just looking at the dark matter. And then, right, I, I have to have a little movie just to show you how this structure forms. So you just saw the Big Bang there. Uh, and sort of contrary to like the gas in this room, as entropy increases, dark matter clusters more. And that's the interesting thermodynamics of, of, of self-gravity. But you can, again, you can see that it, it clusters in this very interesting way. You first get these voids that form. You get collapse along filaments. And then the filaments uh, flow into clusters. And, this, uh, and the scale here is on clusters of galaxies. Say a Milky Way would be about this big on, on that scale. OK, so that's the dark matter. But if we were to put on dark matter goggles and take a look at our own galaxy, this is the kind of structure we ought to see. And that's very different from the structure we actually do see. And the reason that is happening is because, well, baryons actually do matter, right? Um, I happen to like baryons. They're very tasty. Uh, but they have a very different physics going on. Well, they have the self-gravity, but they have other physics that's going on. And we have to model that physics as well. That physics is rather messy. And, and, but part of it involves a smooth particle hydrodynamics, which essentially the next stage of, of the development of Changa was, was adding a a method to do the hydrodynamics that baryons require. And, and we need to do this if we're going to actually make predictions that compare with what the telescopes see. Uh, the, the, the hydrodynamics is kind of hard because it's high Mach number. Uh, we have the same large density contrasts. And um, we prefer using a gridless Lagrangian method. That is, we want to follow the material as it falls into a, into a galaxy. And the other thing is that um, the speed at which, say, gas rotates around the galaxy is like 200 kilometers per second, much greater than the sound speed within that gas, which is, say, 10 kilometers a second or smaller. Uh, for the same reason, we want it to be Galilean invariant. We, don't, we want to ignore the fact that the gas is rotating at 200 kilometers per second around a galaxy when we're studying its collapse into stars. 
And so we use this technique called smooth particle hydrodynamics, which you can think of as a Monte Carlo method for solving the, the Navier-Stokes equation. And it's very natural to put into uh, our gravity solver because it's based on particles, which is exactly what the dark matter solver is using. So we have exactly the same uh, structures. So with all that, we, we call this Changa Unleashed because as well as the gravity solver, we have a massively parallel smooth hydrodynamic, smooth particle hydrodynamics, and then we have these other baryonic effects that we model as subgrid physics. So uh, supernovae is what SNE stands for. We occasionally have these bombs that go off in our simulation. We need to inject those. Uh, those are related to star formation, which happens in the most dense gas, which is shielded from external radiation. SMBH, these are supermassive black holes. It seems like every galaxy, including our own, has one. And, um, and they have an effect on the, 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 the morphology of our galaxies. Uh, so, and we've been testing this code against other codes, like ENZO, uh, to, to, to validate the, the physics that we put in. And we've been quite successful. This is some of the results of our, our current uh, Blue Waters allocation. I'm uh, sorry, former Blue Waters allocation, where we're looking at here the mass in stars in individual galaxies versus the mass in dark matter in those same galaxies. And we're comparing our simulation results in the blue spots to observed results, for example, in the red line, and being very successful at that. Again, part of the success is modeling all the subgrid physics. And so here we have a similar simulation, initial Big Bang, but you see those white dots, those are the supermassive black holes. And although black holes kind of eat everything in sight, they're rather messy eaters. So for, uh, for, for every amount of mass that goes down, roughly a few percent gets converted into energy, uh, creating uh, extremely strong outflows. And it's those kind of outflows that can shut down star formation and help us match uh, the observed stellar mass relationships. So that's cosmology. You're keeping track of my time, I hope. Yeah. OK. Um, I, I want to move on to uh, more fundamental questions. And here, here I, oops. Oh, you want to, do you want to see it again? <laughs> OK. All right. So I'm going to move on from cosmology. So I've talked about uh, how the universe began. Uh, let me pause on how did stars form and, and talk about planet formation. I'm not going to be able to get to intelligent life, uh, if such a thing exists. Um, let me talk about protoplanetary disks. Um, it, this is an amazing period in, in, in planetary studies, because not only are we seeing thousands of planets around other stars, we're also getting direct images of of uh, planet forming system. So this is an image from the uh, ALMA array showing a protoplanetary disk around a nearby star. And so we can uh, understand how a planet's formed by the initial collapse of a cloud forming the star, but around the star, a gaseous disk that has to be there essentially by conservation of angular momentum. And uh, I've been looking at the issue of can these disks be gravitational, gravitationally unstable? And if so, would they f fragment into, say, Jupiter-sized planets? And that depends on the details of the, um, of the gas dynamics. And you also have this extreme range in scales, so you have uh, a protoplanetary disk, so AU is astronomical unit, 1 AU is the distance from the sun to the Earth. So I'll give you a scale here. So the disks are presumably tens of AU in size, but we want to 
model the formation of individual planets, uh, which is, as you can see, many, many times smaller. A tree code would be a great way to do this. And so we can use the same gravity plus uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics tree code to uh, study uh, these kinds of systems. And so we've been doing this with uh, Changa and, and the great, right, because we can so easily scale, we can do uh, systems with an order of magnitude more particles than we've been able to do before. This is important not only because of the dynamic range needed, but, but due to the fact that, well, disks are very delicate objects. And so you can see there's some extra structure in the low resolution simulation that disappears as we go to higher resolution. And that is essentially numerical noise can, can generate instabilities that we want, we, right, we want to uh, uh, resolve out. And so this is the power of being able to scale to large processor count and large number of particles. So I've talked about gas in uh, protoplanetary systems. <clears throat> uh, we're standing, we're standing on, on rocks. And so if we're going to understand terrestrial planets, then we need to understand what is happening to the solid objects. Um, so the chemical com composition of the Earth is highly enhanced in things that can condense silicon, water, iron, and, and they condense out of grains out of the protoplanetary nebula. And, and in fact, that image I showed you uh, from Alma, that's actually uh, the, the radiation is coming from uh, dust grains, so millimeter size uh, 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 grains of uh, either carbonaceous or silicate. Uh, somehow, uh, we don't quite understand this, which is why we need the simulations. These grains do grow to kilometer-sized bodies, which we call planetesimals. Those planetesimals collide to build up larger bodies, which we call protoplanets. And this picture is, is, is very nice because not only will this explain plants by, such as the Earth, but presumably the, the kilometer-sized bodies that don't end up in Earth will, be, will explain the presence of asteroids, comets, other small bodies in our solar system. But now we're talking about, we're not talking about gas or dark matter, which interacts only gravitationally. We're talking about solid objects that actually bump into each other. So our, our simulation model now is that we have these spherical bodies. Uh, they, you still have gravity, but then they bump into each other. And you know, in the first instance, they stick, but perhaps they bounce or they shatter, depending on the collision velocity or impact parameter. Uh, but what we need to do is have something that can quickly detect those collisions. Uh, I got an idea. How about a tree-based? Uh, collision finder. And so we, we have just recently put in collision finding into the Changa simulation code. Uh, somehow, I... And we're getting it to scale quite well. Uh, so this is scaling. The blue is our gravity scaling, where, where flat means uh, perfect scaling. So we're scaling up to, in this case, uh, several thousand uh, uh, processors with only 50 million uh, particles. And, we, and from the orange, we see that we get the collision detection scaling in, in a similar uh, manner. And so uh, one of the things you can uh, study is this uh, problem we call hierarchical growth. Uh, so what I'm plotting here is, so imagine I'm, I'm simulating an annulus of, uh, of planetesimals, rocks, they're banging each into each other and, um, and sticking and growing. And what I'm plotting here is the eccentricity, how eccentric, uh, non-circular the orbit is versus the semi-major axis, that's essentially the distance from the sun, and the size of the particles 
are proportional to the mass. And, and what uh, occurs is something we call oligarchic growth. <clears throat> that is, it's essentially the, the capitalism of planetesimals. The rich get richer, um, and uh, too bad for the rest. Um, and what I'm showing is this is the previous published calculation of this oligarchic growth picture uh, with 4,000 particles. We've extended this to a million particle uh, simulation. And hard to see from the picture, but as you get to higher resolution, you have these resonant interactions of the oligarchs with the rest of the planetesimals. And you notice that the oligarchs now tend to be in more circular orbits than was seen in the lower resolution simulation. This is a good thing. We like our Earth to be in a roughly circular orbit. And we have a, a better explanation for that as we go to higher resolution. And this is work done by my graduate student, Spencer Wallace. Um, back to hydro, right? As we, as we get to higher resolution, we need more accurate um, hydrodynamic solvers. Um, of course, the state of the art is Riemann solvers, where you solve the Riemann uh, problem between your resolution elements. Uh, but you still need, at least for astrophysics, you still need the Galilean invariant. So if I'm going to have cells, those cells better follow the motion of the fluid. And I also need to be able to study arbitrary ge geometry. And so we need something where I can rapidly construct mesh cells that move, that are in an arbitrary uh, geometry. And we need, therefore, I mean, the Varan Varanoi mesh is one. Um... <laughs> OK, I, I think we're, 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 we're doing good. Thank you. Um, so uh, Varanoi mesh is one way to ge generate a mesh with arbitrary geometry. And uh, so we have added a Varanoi mesh generator to, to Manga, and we're calling this new code Manga to, to, uh, to emphasize that this is now a moving mesh hydrodynamic solver. Um, and not to, just some test images. This is work actually by uh, Phil Chang, who, who's from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, who essentially just picked up the code off our website and started uh, working with it. And uh, just to show you, all right, so this is a set off test. I'm familiar with this. You set off a bomb and see what happens. And I'm comparing SBH with, uh, with the moving mesh. And the key thing to point out is that here you see the particle noise that, uh, that SBH has, and that has cleaned up significantly. As, as you move to, as you use the uh, moving mesh. So um, better hydrodynamics, uh, also uh, more sophisticated physics can be put on, on, uh, on the moving mesh. In particular, if you want to solve MHD problems, that is magnetic fields, you want to be sure that you don't uh, well, that div B remains zero, right? We haven't discovered magnetic monopoles yet, so you better not have them in your code. And so uh, with Riemann solvers, you can put in a constrained transport. And the constraint means that div B is enforced to be zero. You can do that with moving mesh. Not so easy to do that with SPH. And so we've implemented uh, MHD. So this is a set off test, but now there's a magnetic field going through the simulation in a diagonal fashion. The other thing we are starting to add to the moving mesh is radiative transfer, both in the flux limited diffusion limit and ray tracing through the mesh. Um, so why am I interested in magnetic fields? Uh, one application, uh, all right, so caveat here, this is Enzo but uh, we're planning on, on, on moving this to, to Manga, is, so this is, uh, this is a galaxy. We know that there are these things called cosmic rays in our galaxy, very energetic particles. Those energetic particles could 
uh, drive and outflow, which is what you're seeing in these panels, but the morphology of that outflow is going to be determined by the magnetic fields because these charged particles are tied to the magnetic field lines. And so these uh, uh, right two panels are showing the effect of what happens when you have the cosmic rays interacting with uh, magnetic fields. And, and clearly, the morphology of the outflow changes as you, uh, as you include the physics of magnetic fields. And this is very important because we're getting observations of material in what's called the circumgalactic medium on the on a very outskirts. I notice I don't have a scale on it. Oh, there it is. All right, so, so our galactic disk is only, say, 20 kiloparsecs across, and we, we can uh, drive flows out into the hundreds of kiloparsecs. Um, Phil uh, Chang and others are also interested in smaller scales, that star formation. Uh, and so this will be future work that uh, is looking at individual molecular clouds, that is birthplaces of stars. Magnetic fields play a big role in how that material collapses down to the sort of uh, astronomical unit scale. Uh, more applications. Uh, and uh, this is just a list of things that I'm starting to do with that can use a, a parallel tree-based code to, uh, well, to, to solve the problems. Endpoint correlation functions. This is a data analysis problem that, uh, that the people with looking at, say, LSST, large surveys, need to study uh, the structure, uh, large-scale structure of galaxies. Uh, gravitational lensing, mapping out the effect of, of gravity of a cluster on how it affects the images of background objects. The um, collisions of asteroids is exactly the same physics when you bang uh, two grains of sand together. And so people are starting uh, to use this kind of code to do granular dynamics. Uh, classification and cluster finding can also use tree codes. Um, and we're proposing to use this for uh, biology, both molecular dynamics, and then there is the uh, basically uh, visualization uh, uh, and, and actually radiative transfer applications that could also use a hierarchical uh, tree code. So I'm mentioning all these, which I'm just starting to get into because we're proposing that we can extend Chang even further via a, uh, a parallel framework that we're calling Paratreat. So um, Sanjay already mentioned the collaboration that had seed money to do this. And, and the idea is to abstract out the tree uh, algorithms so that people writing scientific or, or graphics applications won't have to think about the parallel stuff which, of course, at the bottom, you have the intelligent runtime system. That's code for charm plus uh, plus. On top of it, you have something that can manage the data in, in the trees. And you have uh, uh, higher order algorithms that, you can, that abstract out all these uh, tree operations. So, so I, again, the idea is that a, gen a more general developer won't have to be thinking about all this parallel stuff, but can use the abstraction to do their whatever hierarchical algorithm they're interested in. And, and essentially making this kind of tree parallel infrastructure available to a broader developer community. So speaking of availability, right, all this stuff is downloadable. You can check out a GitHub uh, uh, repository or, or the, uh, to see what we're, we're doing in our design and some sample code. OK, with that, I should thank the people that helped fund this and also thank you for listening. <laughs>